I was just checking out Elizabeth Warren's LinkedIn profile. Uh, has zero connections, but she publishes a lot as a platform. We were just in enjoying that. I'm, I'm sure she has a lot of connections that she's not revealing. Well, the connections are different than followers. So you she's know, I probably did, building an audience. So I mean, we're with Jeff Weiner. Jeff, you know, I consider sort of the Wizard of Oz of jobs in the world. He knows which of you is, has been, it's, it's like naughty and nice. Which of you have updated your profile? Who's looking for a job? Who's in trouble? How many of you have updated your LinkedIn profile in, say, the last week? Yeah, yeah, see, this is it. It's constantly going right, wait, wait. on. How about the last six months? Woo. How about the last year? Everybody. Right. Uh, anyway, good. very impressive. So we're with the man who knows everything about jobs in the world, and well, it's been very that. interesting that, that I... Way to I, set the bar low for our yeah, interview, Steve. Uh, I went and I looked. One of the things, because we are in Washington, D.C., I've gotten to get interested in presidential candidates, and... Uh, and LinkedIn. Hmm. So who has profiles, who use it? It's very interesting. Bernie Sanders can't find him anywhere on there. Uh, Jeb Bush has 6,719 followers compared to say, you know, Barack Obama's not a candidate, but he has about 3 million followers. So I don't know if that's trouble for Jeb Bush or not. The guy, Ben Carson has a profile. Marco Rubio has probably the best looking, but only 40 connections. And, uh, <laughs> And then you've got uh, Hillary Clinton, who's, who's out there, can't tell whether she's using. The guy who uses LinkedIn more than any other presidential candidate is John Kasich, who has way over 500, like, active connections. Mm. So this isn't followers, but it's in the, when you're 500 plus, it could be, you know, you, you don't have, you don't tell us, why don't you tell us the real number? The, the 500 plus was established early on in the company's evolution because we didn't want people uh, thinking it was about quantity versus quality. So uh, it, it wasn't... Uh, so are you saying uh, John Kasich doesn't have quality connections? No, it, it's that after 500, uh, if people started to see that someone was at 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000, they may be incented to go out and start inviting people that are going to be less valuable. So we wanted to uh, emphasize quality. You know, since the last time I interviewed, which was about a year ago, mm. uh, you have purchased a, a company called Linda. Yep. And I was spending some time on, on the website. Linda is a a platform for online courses. I was just watching the one on conflict management. Very, very interesting guy uh, you were telling me about that you, you found so impressive. And as I was watching him really educate me about ways I could cut a new path with my bosses, James Bennett and David Bradley and others, it gave me a lot of insight into what I could do. I was, began thinking about Steve Jobs. What if I worked for Steve Jobs? Have you ever thought about the Steve Jobs challenge in a LinkedIn frame? Uh, when you say the, the, the Steve Jobs challenge, have what, you what seen the movie? Uh, he was kind of complicated. Yeah. So, so you know, I think uh, different managerial styles work differently at different companies for different people. And uh, I, the way he led Apple is hard to argue with in terms of results. But yeah, it wasn't for everybody. Yeah. You did you did you share his management style? I think we have different management styles. I think so too. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I found interesting as well is your focus on an economic graph. You've been very committed to, to finding a digital way to tell the story. You know, the Atlantic is in, in, in storytelling, but you're also in storytelling, mm -hmm. and you're helping to tell the story of what people across different job terrains, what their situations are, what the flow of talent is in the world, and you've begun to work with cities. It's very interesting. Tell us a little bit about LinkedIn Cities. Well, before we get to LinkedIn Cities, let's take a step back and talk about the economic graph. Right. And uh, for those that don't know, uh, the economic graph is LinkedIn's effort to really operationalize and, and manifest our vision, which is to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. And there's over 3 billion people in the global workforce. So uh, the way in which we're going to set out to do this is by essentially digitally mapping the global economy. And what we'd like to do is map uh, certain pillars of the global economy in terms of the creation of opportunity for people, much the same way we've mapped out professional relationships. We have mm -hmm. 380 million people who've signed up to join LinkedIn to date, and we've been able to map those relationships, and that's how we create a lot of value for folks. But uh, the, the broader vision is to go well beyond people. So there's six pillars or dimensions to the economic graph. Mm -hmm. We'd ultimately like there to be a, a profile on LinkedIn for every member of the global workforce, so north of three billion people. A profile for every company in the world, and when you include small and medium-sized businesses, there's on the order of 60 to 70 million companies in the world. A digital representation for every job availability in the world, on the order of 10 to 20 million at any given time that could be digitally represented. Uh, a digital representation of every skill required to mm -hmm. obtain those jobs, and to your point earlier, 
uh, with the acquisition of Linda, it goes beyond uh, recommending to someone what skill they need. We can actually provide them some of the coursework to make that happen. We'd like there to be a profile for every university, higher educational organization, or vocational training facility that makes it possible to acquire those skills. And then we want to provide a publishing platform, to your point earlier, about some of the politicians that are running for office right now and the, the followers that they've generated and the audience that they've built. We want to make it easy for every individual, every company, and every university to share their professionally relevant knowledge to the extent they're interested in doing so. And then we want to take a step back and allow capital, all forms of capital, intellectual capital, working capital, of course, human capital, to flow to where it can best be leveraged. And in doing so, the hope is that we can help lift and transform the global economy. As you talk about the fungibility of that capital, particularly talent, workers, in the real world, as opposed to in the LinkedIn world, that's a lot harder to do, that moving, and when you look at borders, that, that, that what we saw you know, in past senses of what globalization was supposed to be, mm -hmm. you know, smart globalization was the, the, the more frictionless move of financial capital, ideas, investment, but people never quite moved as well, and there were all sorts of problems with that. Do you sense that once you digitally map all of this, that you actually create political pressure to make it easier for people to flow in this? I hadn't necessarily thought about it from the perspective of political pressure, but we certainly can remove friction. We can remove friction by virtue of leveraging the data that we have. Mm -hmm. So you take a lot of the subjectivity and a lot of the guesswork out of this in terms of where the fastest growing jobs are, the skills required to obtain those jobs, the aggregate skills of a work a workforce in any given locality. You can measure the size of the gap between that skilled workforce and the skills that are necessary. And as a result, there's some really interesting things that we can do. One of our uh, favorite, I think one of the use cases we're most excited about is to create uh, a situation where we can leverage data and provide that data to vocational training facilities, mm. uh, community colleges, even four-year universities within any given city to suggest uh, where that gap exists and equip them uh, with information so they can create essentially a just-in-time curriculum. So they're training people for the jobs that are and will be as opposed to the jobs that once were. And that's what our LinkedIn Cities uh, effort is all about. Yeah, tell us about that. Yeah, so and the dashboard. And can I have a dashboard? You, you will make a dashboard for you, Steve, if that's what you want. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, two different initiatives. Uh, so one is uh, LinkedIn Cities, which is essentially uh, a, a prototype, or you can think of it as a, a beta or an experiment, uh, that we're running in conjunction and partnership with uh, the Markle Group, mm -hmm. uh, which is... Uh, this is the Markle Foundation. Markle yeah. Foundation and uh, their effort to uh, help put Americans back to work through Re Rework America. And uh, they've partnered uh, with edX, and we're partnering uh, with uh, Arizona State University who's doing some really interesting forward-thinking uh, educational programs online. And in Phoenix, Denver, and eventually more broadly in Colorado, uh, we're going to identify uh, middle skill opportunities. Mm -hmm. So middle skills are those skills that require more than a secondary education, but less than a, a four-year degree. So uh, things that can be taught through vocational training, things that can be taught through community colleges. Uh, so think of healthcare technicians or HVAC repair uh, or welders, for example. Uh, IT specialists, and in both Phoenix and Denver, we see very high concentrations of middle skill opportunities. We also see higher concentrations of uh, active service people or veterans, and we see uh, very forward-thinking uh, educational infrastructure. And so we're working with Markle, we're working with local government uh, to figure out the best way to align uh, people who are seeking those kinds of skills uh, with the job opportunities that exist, and this way we can start to uh, really bring the economic graph to life, as opposed to talking about it in theory. Okay, dashboard. So the dashboard piece, I think, works hand in hand uh, with the LinkedIn Cities effort. Uh, but while we'll have feet on the street in those two cities, uh, the dashboarding effort uh, enables us to provide data and insights uh, to cities, mayoral offices, uh, governor offices, uh, at scale. And we're doing this uh, in parallel with these two LinkedIn City efforts. So we're working with uh, 30 cities more broadly, and eventually it'll be a much bigger number than that, uh, to provide unique insights and data regarding uh, talent inflows and outflows into the mm -hmm. city, uh, what skills uh, people are graduating with within those cities and states, uh, the largest employers, the fastest growing jobs, the fastest growing skills, and we've been able to work uh, with a number of groups uh, to really make a difference. Most recently, uh, one of the things that we're excited about is work we're doing with uh, the mayor's office in New York City. 
and their effort on the tech talent pipeline. So uh, we evaluated uh, three million uh, profiles uh, within New York City to understand where the skills were in terms of our members, 150,000 businesses, and identified that New York City could fill roughly 100,000 jobs that had some kind of technical proficiency required. And uh, the, the mayor's office had earmarked about $10 million to invest in that program and uh, recently just announced that they're going to be requiring uh, that programming skills are taught in all the schools in New York City, K-12. Right, so this is Mayor de Blasio. He loves this. I, I, I was talking to him. So does that mean you're going to have LinkedIn profiles for 11- and 12-year-olds? Uh, that, no, I don't know that we'd going? go that young. Uh, yeah. we, we have, uh, within the last few years, we did lower the age requirement because Which, interestingly what, oh, enough... Oh, really? What is the age requirement to get on? So, uh, historically, it was uh, 18 and above, uh, and more recently, we lowered that. It depends on the country. Um, in certain countries, uh, it's 16 and older, 15 and older, 14 and older. Uh, it depends on, on the environment. But one of the things that's increasingly becoming apparent is that students are starting to think about their career paths and starting to acquire those skills or think about what skills they want to acquire much younger than they did certainly when I was in school. And uh, I think that's a reflection of the evolution of technology and the way in which people are learning now, going back to the Linda discussion. Mm -hmm. Uh, people are, are learning through online mechanisms at their own pace, and they right. don't have to wait to be taught no, those it's skills. No, it's a great website. I went in and found a lot of things to do. But the other thing I like when you talk about middle skills in LinkedIn is, is I think many of the people in this room are probably the higher end of the professional category. Maybe I'm wrong. I apologize if, if that's the case. When you look at the middle skills, what I found interesting is people are able to tell their story in video and other kind of rich formats mm that I found surprising. It's not something, so it's not just a resume. It actually, they're telling their stories in different ways. Uh, and the storytelling dimension of it has really changed, in my, in my view, from what you were doing two or three years ago. Well, it's interesting. Storytelling is so fundamental to human nature. Mm -hmm. As Deepak Chopra likes to say, we are the stories that we tell. Mm -hmm. And it's so core to, to really humanity. And if you think about it, uh, the way in which people are representing their professional brand or identity is no different. The way in which companies talk about the work that they're doing is no different. It comes down to a narrative. And one of the things we recognized within the last several years is that uh, the way in which you represent yourself should go well beyond words and text and this mm. more linear storytelling, if you will. Right. And so you think about someone with, uh, who's in the middle skill sector and uh, the opportunity for them to bring that to life. So rather than describe the skill to mm. actually demonstrate the work that they're doing, and they can do that through video, they can do that through images, and so essentially the profile or the resume becomes a portfolio. What about you? You talk about Phoenix and Denver, and, and you're working with New York. These are cities that kind of have it together. What about stressed out cities like Detroit? Yep. You know, Detroit's had some, some rough bumps, had some complications. We've you know, seen the movies where people who had, you know, had long you know, tenured positions are having, you know, because sometimes those positions aren't out there, jobs in there. What can you do for a place like Detroit? So we would love to take LinkedIn cities to Detroit and to New Orleans, and ultimately that's absolutely the plan, is to be able to expand beyond uh, Denver and Phoenix uh, to the cities that uh, may need it the most. Uh, what's really exciting is the, the renaissance, the resurgence that's taking place mm. in cities like Detroit. And that's both public sector and private sector cooperation. You're seeing an infusion of capital into some of these markets, uh, startup efforts. Uh, so it's, it's been very encouraging to see. You know, you, you were rated as the highest rated CEO, like in the world, uh, by Glassdoor. <laughs> I, don't I don't know if uh, it's you know, in the world. Yeah, I, mean, well, I mean, might as well, right? I mean, <laughs> if you're highest rated in America, what are you gonna, where's the competition, China? So, so. <sighs> I, I'm sort of interested in, in what makes you so special, you think. Are they just brown nosing? Are they looking for new jobs? Or Thanks for that encouragement, yeah. <laughs> Steve, and for validating that uh, <laughs> feedback. Uh, you know, I, I, you try not to place too much emphasis on, on ratings or, or rankings, but uh, that was something that I, I was really proud of because mm. it came from our employees. And I think it, it's a reflection of the fact that we're walking the walk on our culture and our values, as opposed to just talking about those things. We're a very purpose-driven organization. We have a very clear understanding of where we're trying to take the business and the value that we can add in the world. We've built an incredible team. I mean, any time you see a, a CEO ranked or rated in, in something like that, that's really a reflection of the leadership team, and that's a reflection of, of the job that they're doing in terms of uh, bringing to life what the company's trying to accomplish. And my colleague Derek Thompson recently had a, a cover story of The Atlantic called The Future of Work, which, which really was about the future of not working hmm. uh, in, in the sense that 
as you look at what's happening in the economy, that more and more will be automated, and people will have new choices in terms of you know, enjoying their lives. He says, maybe it's not so bad. But as you, you know, I'm interested in, you know, you do, I, I joke about it, but you actually do see so much data about the churn in the economy, about, you know, I look at, you know, people that come up on the stage and say, you know, you know unemployment is down and we've created all these jobs. The, the truth is that we're about a million short uh, uh, in high paying jobs and about a million jobs short in mid paying jobs. And so it hasn't been operating the same way. So when you look at that data, are you worried about the kinds of things Derek highlighted that the whole nature of our social contract with workers being able to earn a good li living, help their kids have better lives is, is coming unstuck in some way? Well, there, there's at least two different things to what you said there. One is this uh, potential uh, secular trend in which technology and globalization is displacing jobs and the jobs that are available, the supply of jobs uh, in, in the economy. Uh, the second is what happens when you, you, you scratch below the surface of the 5% unemployment, which is you know, clearly moving in the right direction, but we still have north of 18 million people in the United States who are unemployed, underemployed, or marginally attached to the workforce. They've been looking for a job for so long that they've essentially started to drop out. Mm. And we have nearly 6 million available jobs in this country that are unfilled today. Now, now, part of that is systemic. There's always going to be turnover. But part of that is the fact that we have a mismatch. So answer that question, because I hear people say we have all these job openings mm. and you've got them listed. You also know where all the talent is. And this is one of the big debates, is the high-tech companies say, we need to open the doors because we can't, don't have the people to fill the jobs. You know the truth to that answer. Mm. So are the people here in the U.S. An, uh, uh, adequate enough to fill the jobs that are open? So it's, it's mixed, and it depends on the region, it depends mm. on the kind of jobs, it depends on the kind of skills that we were talking about. But one thing I think is inarguable, and that's the fact that by virtue of having a view into this data, uh, we can take the guesswork out and we can do a much better job of aligning our educational infrastructure. Uh, we referred to that earlier, uh, vocational training facilities, uh, community colleges, two-year programs, eventually even four-year universities, uh, to be better preparing the workforce for the jobs that are gonna be growing the fastest. Uh, one of the things that the data also provides, which you and I talked about the last time we got together, uh, is outcomes data. Right. So universities uh, traditionally have marketed themselves uh, based on the kinds of opportunities that their students could eventually realize as opposed mm -hmm. to using actual data to suggest that if you go to our school, you're going to be more likely to have a job in the following industry, earn the following amount of money. We have all that data. For, for every person that has graduated uh, an educational program, a higher educational program that has a LinkedIn profile, uh, we know where they're working. We know what kind of company they're working at. We know their level of seniority. Ultimately, we'll be able to tie that back to uh, salary information in the aggregate, obviously not on a, a personalized basis. And this kind of data unlocks insights that enable us to make a real difference in terms of bridging the divide. You're going to be up on Capitol Hill today, and you're going to meet with different groups. Um, uh, we were just talking about some of them, and you've I'm not, I won't disclose the deep secret that you said not to, but as you talk to these people... There was no secret. You know, <laughs> that makes it sound much more interesting, though. No, so. It was interesting. But as you talk to legislators, you know, how, I mean, how would you rank them? Are they, are they in tune with the kinds of things you can bring? I mean, one, one of the things, when you meet people from the West Coast like you are, you're out there changing the world. You're redefining uh, the way we see ourselves. You've created platforms that, that is very much... People, people are rushing to you to give their information. Um, what, what do you think this town can do to either help or hinder um, the kind of work you do on behalf of folks that are trying to, to get new jobs? Because I find this, this not a, you know, sort of an uninspiring place lately, and I'm wondering why you're spending time with them. So, it's not, not, leading the wit, not leading the witness, not, yeah. a, not a loaded question at all. So uh, we're going to be sitting down later uh, with some folks in Congress and, and senators uh, to share with them uh, the dashboards and the insights that we were talking about earlier, which we're really excited to do. And we've had occasion to do this in the past. Uh, this will be a, a broader group of folks that will have... Uh, I'd like to have a dashboard of this room. We could do a dashboard yeah, for this yeah, room. Yeah. We'll do your dashboard, as you mentioned yeah, earlier. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a few observations. One is the thoughtfulness and the appetite uh, to understand uh, these insights and to be able to act upon them. And, uh, you know, I, I think folks here are r really interested in making a difference and really interested in leveraging technology and leveraging data in a way that may not 
seem obvious if you're on the outside looking in. And when you're meeting with folks on an individual basis, uh, their desire to make a difference uh, is very obvious. What happens when you have to run through you know, the political infrastructure is something altogether different. And hopefully by virtue of being able to leverage objective facts and data, it can help accelerate some of the change and help bring folks together. There's bipartisan efforts. You know, one thing I would, I would leave this group with is an idea that I think uh, benefits uh, a number of different constituents in a very meaningful way and something that's possible mm -hmm. with some of the infrastructure we've been talking about, which is this idea that you could potentially train people in the armed services with skills and for opportunities when they're serv servicing the country so that when they return, it can be put to work building out infrastructure, both bricks and mortar and digital infrastructure mm, right. that puts people to work and helps us become more competitive. And that's something I think we can all get behind. Fascinating. I, I looked at your LinkedIn profile mm -hmm. today and spent some time in it. It looks, if you're looking for a new job, it's a really good uh, uh, profile. <laughs> yeah, I want to recommend it. And, and I'm I did gainfully notice, employed. Yeah, I'm all, I, I'm yeah, all set. Yeah, I did know, but I did notice that the people that, that look at your profile, the next profiles they look at are Barack Obama, Ariana Huffington, uh, uh, we've got Jack Welch and Michael Dell. Is there anybody here you wish you were being looked at next to that's not on your list? Uh, I think that's a, good, that's a good list. That's a good list. That's a good Jeff Weiner, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.